lost civilizations, how do you get back to the future? Some years ago now, a submarine sunk off the coast of the United States of America when another US <coughs> ship rammed it, and most of the submariners drowned, but there were about five or six men in one of the compartments who were trapped. And the US wondered, how can we get these men out of here? So they sent divers down to the submarine, and as they were swimming over the hold of the submarine, the hull, they sensed, and feeling over the top of it, they felt someone tapping from inside. And they realised someone was tapping a message in Morse code. And this was the message that was being tapped. Is there any hope? That's a pretty good question when you're trapped in a submarine, isn't it? And you know, when we think about our world today and what we talked about some of the things, many people are, as it were, tapping a message on the inside of this planet. And that's the same question. Is there any hope? It's all very well to know what the future holds, but what about the future? Is there any hope? And that's a question that many people have on their mind today as they're thinking of the future. And we want to answer that question tonight by going back to ancient Babylon and to an amazing prophecy that uh, is found comes from the, the, the city of Babylon and uh, the book of Daniel is found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now Nebuchadnezzar, as we mentioned, destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. He made three raids against the city and finally flattened the city in the third raid. And one of the captives he took was this man called Daniel. I guess some of us have heard of Daniel in Sunday school, the man in the lion's den and so on. Well, this is the Daniel, and uh, he was an advisor to the king of Babylon. Now, the book of Daniel itself was written about 530 BC. That means the original. We don't have the originals. We just have copies of the originals. And uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls contain many fragments of the book of Daniel. The scholars believe it was a favourite of these Essene people who they believe copied these Dead Sea Scrolls. 100 to 200 BC, we now understand. These scrolls are very old indeed, way back in time, at least the copies. Now in the second chapter of Daniel, he tells us how one night King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And uh, he was petrified about his dream. Now, you wonder, why would a guy get worked up about a dream? Well, we now know, because the Babylonians believed dreams were omens of the future. They believed your dream was something that was indicative of what was going to happen. In fact, you can go to the British Museum and you can see this dream omen tablet. Just like they had models of the sheep's liver to try to help them predict the future, so they had these clay tablets about dreams and predicting the future. So whoever wrote the book of Daniel must have understood these things, you see. He must have been there in those times. Well, the king wakes up and he wants to know what his dream means. What's the omen? What's going to happen? What do I need to do to avoid what may be going to happen? So he calls in his advisors and he wants to know what his dream means. Now, according to the biblical records, his advisors were astrologers. Uh, and magicians and psychics, we would call them today. Now, that again is not a makeup. We now know that the Babylonians were big into astrology. For example, you can go to the Louvre Museum in Paris and you will see this Babylonian astrology chart. If you can read the cuneiform writing, you can maybe work out your love life here, you know. But they believe that, the, you know, Astrology was a way to know the future, and here's a Babylonian astrology chart. So these men come in, and he says to them, Now listen, I, I had this terrible dream last night, and I really want to know what it means. Please help me. They said, No problem. Tell us what you dreamt. He says, Well, that is the problem. I've forgotten what I dreamt. Uh, and then they said, no, Well, what do you expect? you expect us to be able to tell you what it means if you don't even tell us what it was? <coughs> And uh, he said, now listen, if you guys are so clever, you tell me what I dreamt, then I'll believe the spin that you put on the drink, you know. So he had him over a barrel here a bit, and of course they couldn't come up with the goods. They said, in fact, only the gods know what you, what you dreamt, and they don't live around here, according to the Babylonians. Now, 
Uh, back in those days, if you couldn't tell the king what he wanted to hear, there was only one thing, and that was death. This is why that doesn't happen with Malcolm Turnbull today, isn't it? You know, you're one of his advisors and you can't come up with the good, so he says, sorry about this. You're dead, you're gone. But that's the way the Babylonians did it back in their time. And so Daniel did what every one of us would do. He prayed. There are no atheists in foxholes, they say. Because he was an advisor. He wasn't an astrologer. He wasn't a psychic in that sense of the Babylonians. But he was an advisor. And they came to round him up. And he said, hey, what's the deal here? What, what's, what's this all about? They told him the king's dream, that he had a dream. And, no one, and that's why he was about to lose his head too. So he said, God help me. And he asked God for help. By the way, that's a good lesson for you and I today, you know. There are times when we get caught between a rock and a hard place and many people don't want to, you know, ask God, but he's only too happy to help us. He helped Daniel here. And so he prayed, and that night he was given the same dream. And then he comes into the king the next day, and he says, King, I know what you dream. So as he comes into the king, he says, King, this is what happened. You dreamt of this great huge statue that was made of various metals. The head was made up here of gold, and uh, then the head gave way to silver chest and arms, and then after the silver chest and arms, the belly and the thighs were made of bronze or brass, the legs were made of iron, and then the feet were made of iron and clay. And then he said you saw a stone that was cut out of a mountain without any hands, it smashed the image on the feet, knocked the thing to pieces, the wind blew the pieces away, and that stone became a huge mountain and it filled up the whole world. And you can imagine the king's eyes would have popped out of his head. That's exactly what I dreamt, Daniel. Now, he had his attention, didn't he? If you can tell the dream, he's very interested to find out what does it mean. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at that. In fact, this is what Daniel said to the king. He wasn't uh, an egotist, but this is what he said. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Now remember, we're looking at a document uh, that is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Daniel, dating back 100 to 200 BC. And you're going to see some incredible things that take us way beyond that in just a moment. But the originals date back to 600 BC, thereabouts, 530. Now, what Daniel was shown was a succession of four world superpowers from his day right on down to where we're living today. You'll notice uh, how he explained it to the king. And finally, he shows us the last empire. That's the rock that strikes the image on the feet. And he explains that as we'll see in a moment. Now he says, king, let's consider this image, the head of gold, first of all. You are the head of gold. Now, the, in other words, your kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, is represented by this head of gold. Now this was a very fitting symbol for the Babylonians who ruled from about 605 BC when we know that Nabopolassar, the father of Nebuchadnezzar, began that empire and went down to about 539 BC when the next superpower took over. Now, Babylon was indeed a golden empire, and that idea of a golden head was very fitting. For example, if you look at the ancient civilization of Babylon, when the Persians came, the Medes and the Persians came under Cyrus the Great, they took away many treasures from Babylon. Not only that, but when we come down a little bit in time to Xerxes, he took away $150 million worth of treasure, way down a little bit longer. Now, by the way, Xerxes, in the biblical records, is the husband of Queen Esther, if you've ever read that story in the biblical records. Then Alexander the Great came 200 years later, and he took away 500 camels loaded with gold. Now, you get an idea that this was a very fitting symbol for ancient Babylon. Let's have a look at this old city of Babylon. It's one of the most amazing cities in ancient time. For example, it was 16 kilometres around. Now, you say, that's a pretty pathetic looking city isn't it compared to what we have here in Sydney or some other place but in ancient times this was quite a city size for example the Rome, city of Rome was only about 10 kilometers around roughly and Athens which was one of the great civilized cities of ancient times was only about six and a half kilometers around so you can see Babylon was no mean city now when you came to Babylon you would come into the city through what we call the Ishtar Gates 
And uh, these are not the real ones. This is not the real one. This is a replica of the real one. The real one's found in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. If you ever go to Berlin, go to the Pergamon Museum and you can see these gates here and you'll notice these composite creatures decorate these gates. Now, coming off from this processional way, there was a coming off from these gates was a processional way and you can see these glazed lions here brick, glazed brick with, in the shape of lions by the way if you've ever read the book of Daniel and you mustn't uh, miss that book I'm sure you'll be running seminars on it sometime and uh, going to this book but you will notice that these lions here have wings on them that's exactly mentioned in the book of Daniel in the 7th chapter as a symbol of Babylon the lion with wings and that's right there on the palace uh, processional way. Now, the founder of Nebuchadnezzar, what we call the Neo-Babylonian Empire, the new Babylon, because Babylon had existed for centuries, had been destroyed uh, by the Assyrians, and now the rebuilder, if you like, according to the Bible in the fifth chapter, sorry, the fourth chapter of Daniel, was Nebuchadnezzar. But historians said that's a bunch of baloney if I can use that term, that's nonsense that's not true, that's a myth, that's a legend because we believe it's a lady called Samarinus at the 7th, 8th century BC um, and then they discovered, as they began excavating here, uh, some interesting things, in fact on the Ishtar gates you can see an inscription on the side of the Ishtar gates and this is what it says, Nebuchadnezzar was the founder of Babylon not only that but you can go to that same museum and you see these bricks and these bricks have Nebuchadnezzar's name on them in fact over here we have a real brick from Babylon if you want to feel something that's real old I'm sure we don't mind if you touch that one <laughs> but this is a brick with Nebuchadnezzar's name on these are really this is like 2,600 years old this is the real deal this one not a replica but you can see if you his name was on it now scholars now know that this was the man who really rebuilt Babylon, just like the Bible said. And that's again why Albright said what he said. The Bible is historically accurate. So what happened to Babylon? Well, notice what the Bible tells us. As Daniel talks to this king, 2,600 years ago nearly, as he talks to this king, he says, listen king, after you, after you shall arise another kingdom that's inferior to yours, just like silver is inferior to gold. Now this was the kingdom of Medo-Persia and it defeated the Babylonians in 539 BC. Now listen, some other time I'm sure the people who are sponsoring this seminar uh, will be running a seminar and you must look at this 8th chapter of Daniel. The 8th chapter of the book of Daniel is incredible because right there it mentions by name the Medo-Persians before they even came to power and it mentions the Greeks by name. And it mentions who, that the first king would be the one who would topple the Babylonians. That's uncanny accuracy written way before the events happen. So he mentions them by name in the 8th chapter, but he says this is the next part, the silver. Defeated the, Medo, the Medo-Persians defeated the Babylonians. They ruled for about 200 years until 331 BC. Now according to the Bible... The last king of Babylon was a man by the name of Belshazzar. That's what the Bible says. And again, the scholars back a few years ago, they said, that's another mistake. That's another myth. That's another blunder in the Bible. That's not true, they said. Because we know that the last king of Babylon was Nabonidus. And that's true. So how can this be right? Well, then they began to excavate in uh, some of the ancient cities of Mesopotamia and they discovered the Nabonidus cylinder and on the Nabonidus cylinder it tells us that Belshazzar was the son of Nabonidus now they knew this guy did exist but was he the king? that's another question but he was his son by the way you can see a replica of some of these tablets with the name of Belshazzar on them these are very famous tablets because they confirm what this book says as they dug more they came across this Chronicle, part of the Babylonian Chronicles, known as the Nabonidus Chronicle, and this chronicle tells us this, and it's a replica of that here tonight too. Nabonidus entrusted the kingship to Belshazzar in the third year of his reign. So when they saw that, they realised the Bible was right. This king, Babylon of Belshazzar, was a co-regent because we now know that the Babylonian king went off to a place called Temer 
and, and did his religious things out there and left his son in charge of Babylon. He was in charge when, the, when they came through. So the Bible was right and our scholars acknowledge that this indeed was the last king of Babylon. He was a co-regent with his father. And by the way, if you're interested more, have a look at this. This is the Babylonian Chronicle. You can see why these tablets are, are very famous now. Because they show what Albright was saying about the biblical records. They're not myths and legends. It's historically accurate. Well, the fateful night for the Babylonians was October 13, 539 BC. The Medo-Persian army under Cyrus the Great was besieging Babylon. They had had a fight with the Babylonians outside the city some time before. The Babylonians had been defeated. They ran back inside their city. And now the city was being besieged by Cyrus the Great. Inside the city, according to the Bible, there was a party going on one night where King Belshazzar had a party for all his lords and ladies. And wine and women and song was the order of the day or the night. And as they're partying on, suddenly, Daniel says, a bloodless hand wrote a message on the plaster of the palace wall. Just a hand writing a message. And the party stopped right there. You can imagine it stopped, wouldn't it? You, it this, this talk has stopped tonight if we all saw a hand writing a message on the wall. I'll tell you. We'd be knocking our knees together. That's what the Bible says. Nebuchadnezzar, Bell says it was frightened. What on earth does that mean? That's an omen, you see, of course. So he calls in his advisors, his astrologers and the psychics, but they couldn't tell him what it meant. And finally, the <coughs> queen who heard the commotion, because the king was petrified, he was crying out. She came in and she said, listen, get that old man Daniel, because he's an old man by this time. Get him in here. He'll, he, he can tell you what it means. So Daniel comes in and he tells him what the writing means. This was the writing. Mene, mene, take a little pass. And he said, listen, the word mene means that God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. You've been playing life in the fast, living life in the fast lane, Belshazzar. Game up. Come to the end right now. Not a very nice message to hear. He says the word tikkun means you are weighing the balances and you're found wanting. Now, have you ever seen some of the scenes from the Book of the Dead in the Egyptian? scenes from the Book of the Dead in their papyrus documents, you will notice that the balances are very famous for judgment. They were symbols of judgment in the ancient world for the Egyptians and also here the Babylonians. Daniel uses it for this. The balances, you know, when you weigh your food and so on. You've been weighed in the balance pan, Nebuchadnezzar, and you come up the wrong way, man. It's not good. Not looking good. And then the last words he says, here it is. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And what a message to get when you're having a great party that night and it stopped the dead in its tracks. But it's a good, it's a good lesson for us today. You know, this is not the time in the world to party on dude sort of thing. This is a very serious time in Earth's history as scientists tell us, uh, historians tell us, uh, politicians and, and uh, people Law and forces, we are in a, in a different time. We need to be thinking of what's going on. Now, what happened? Well, the Euphrates River, Nebuchadnezzar, when he rebuilt the city, he built the city on both sides of the part of the river Euphrates that, that flowed through the city. So the city has got a river going through it. And coming off from the river, he had gates. Let's go back here. He had gates coming off from into the wall, the wall was built along both sides of the river as it wound its way, and then there were gates at both ends, so as the river entered the city, there's a gate and as it exits, there's another gate at that end and then there are walls along the river bank because the city's on both sides and there are gates going from the wall into the city so they considered this a city that you couldn't take because of this well, anyway, there's the party going on and meanwhile, Cyrus has his soldiers do a bit of tinkering with part of the river that flows out as, it, as it comes into the city. He diverted the river, or part of it, by digging channels off from the river, and this lowered the river a, bit, a little bit, so that the soldiers could actually wade in the water, and it lowered it enough so they could get under those gates, but they still weren't in the city because there's the side gates too. 
But evidently, for some reason, we're not sure, those gates were left open by the soldiers who probably were parting off, and the city was taken without much of a fight. The Babylonians were conquered that night, and the Medo-Persians took over the city. Now, what's fascinating is when you go to the prophet Isaiah, who's living 150 years before, he predicted that Cyrus would actually take the city of Babylon. He even mentions the gates would be left open. An uncanny prophecy. That's 150 years before. And Cyrus is mentioned in the Bible. 700 BC, thus says the Lord. By the way, in other words, this scroll here, this long Isaiah scroll, it contains the mention of Cyrus in it, you see. 700 BC. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armour of kings, to open before him the double doors, because that's what the sort of gates they have. You can see them in the British Museum, double door gates. So the gates will not be shut. Here's a prediction about the very event that Daniel talked to the king about. And by the way, ancient historians, Herodotus and Xenophon, they mention similar things about the destruction of, or the takeover of Babylon. So does the historian Josephus, who mentions that this prediction was made before, about 140 years he mentions in his writings, before Cyrus even came along. And of course the famous Cyrus cylinder that we have here is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you've ever read the Bible, you will read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. You remember the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem? They took the people captive to Babylon, and they were there for 70 years roughly. And the Bible predicted in Jeremiah that after 70 years they came out, and they did. And then Ezra and Nehemiah record that, and they say that when the Persians took over, King Cyrus allowed the people to go back to Jerusalem and to build their temple. And that's why this is important, because Cyrus tells us that's the very sorts of thing he did. He allowed the people to go back to their homelands and build up their temples in different nations. So this is very important confirmation of what we're just seeing here. In other words, there are predictions that are being made again and again, and even history is recording that this is what happened. <coughs> now, Daniel continues. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. So let's come down out of the silver chest and arm. Uh, sorry, the belly and thighs of bronze, I should say. Greece defeated the Medo-Persians. 331 BC. Now you can visit the great city of Athens today, and of course that's the famous icon building, isn't it? The Parthenon. Now, the Medo-Persians had invaded Greece at least twice, or more than that, but two particular times, one under Darius the Great and one under Xerxes. And during the time of one of those great attacks on the, the Athenians, they destroyed that magnificent structure. They burnt the thing. And the Greeks never forgot that. And they never forgave the Medo-Persians for that. Because when the, Medo, the Greeks came to power, they, under Alexander the Great, came and they came to Iran. And they destroyed this magnificent city called Persepolis. It's one of the most amazing structures you can see in the ancient world. Even beautiful quite now. But it was burnt by the Greeks under Alexander the Great. You can see some of the Medes and the Persians there on the right-hand side there. An amazing city. Now, the Greeks ruled from about 331 to 168 BC, but Daniel continued. There's coming a fourth power. He said to the king, listen, finally there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron. And uh, this, of course, was the great power of the Romans. So if you know your history, that's what happened. The Romans defeated the Greeks. Now, you think about it. That's how we study history today, isn't it? <coughs> In the Mediterranean world I'm talking about. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And yet the Bible predicted it before it all happened. And more yet, as you're going to see, taking us down to our own time. Now the Romans were a formidable fighting machine, as you know. They conquered just everything from almost down in... Uh, to the borders of India just about, and certainly Mesopotamia, right up to Great Britain and down into Egypt and across much of northern Europe. This was the Iron Legs, called the Iron Monarchy by the historian Gibbon. Daniel continued. King, he said, 
whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. We're down in the feet now. The kingdom shall be divided. This fourth kingdom will be a divided kingdom. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. Now, if you know anything about your history, you know that the western part of the Roman Empire became divided. By the year 476, the Western Roman Empire has collapsed, it's disintegrated because of the what we call the barbaric tribes of, uh, in the, what we would call Europe today. And by the way, those various tribes became what we call Europe today, Western Europe. The Visigoths became the Spanish, the Suevi, the Portuguese, you've got the Franks became the French, and the Anglo-Saxons, the English. This is what we, that was the breakup of part of the breakup of the Western Roman Empire. And we would call that Western Europe today. That's what the Bible says. This fourth part will be divided and that's exactly what we have seen in time. Now, notice what he says. As iron, you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another just as iron does not mix with clay. In other words, this old breakup of the Roman Empire is never going to be stuck together again. Never going to be one superpower again like it was in the days of Rome. Now, you think of the attempts that have been made through time to do the very opposite, to unite Europe. For example, you think of Charlemagne up here, about 900 AD. He had to go, but he failed. He had the Holy Roman Empire neither holy nor Roman really and then we have Louis the 14th of France he gave it a good try and of course Napoleon Bonaparte so some of these men tried Napoleon's an interesting one this is what Napoleon said about he, how he wanted to take over Western Europe there will be one Europe he said there will be one currency there will be one language there will be one government over all of Europe meaning the French will rule over Europe. And then when Napoleon Bonaparte was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, this is what he said, God Almighty is too much for me. Interesting comment the man's making there, isn't it? But have a look at this one. This is fascinating. What about Kaiser Wilhelm? He knew about this prophecy in the book of Daniel. And this is what he said. Daniel's prophecy does not fit with my plans. I can't accept that. Where Charlemagne and others have failed, I will succeed. And one of the most fascinating places to visit today is the Metz Cathedral. Now, the Metz Cathedral used to be in Germany because if you've known a little bit about your history from the First World War, after the war, they sort of shift some boundaries and Metz became part of France. So that's when you visit Metz today, it's in France. But in the First World War, it was in Germany. Anyway, around this time of the First World War, the people who ran this great cathedral, they came to the Kaiser, the leader of Germany, and said, Kaiser, we need a real new roof for our church. Will you pay for it? He said, yes, on one condition. He said, listen, you know around your church you've got some statues, and one of those statues is the prophet Daniel. You take the head of that man, that head off that thing, and put my head on top, and I'll fix your roof. Because he knew, you see, about this prophecy we just read. He knew and it didn't agree with his plan because he wanted to take the lot and Daniel said, you won't take the lot. Well, we know who won. Kaiser Wilhelm did not take all of Europe. Then, of course, there was Adolf Hitler. He thought he was going to have a thousand-year right, but it lasted ten years. And he never took it. One people, one empire, one leader, said Adolf Hitler. And, of course, it failed. And I think, you know, it's incredible. We're talking about a track record of fulfilled predictions we get them one after another in one prophecy here tonight it's amazing they will not adhere one to another even marriage relationships because Daniel said he said this they will mix with one another in marriage but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay now you think about that if you've ever done a little bit of European history, you notice all the intermarriage between the houses of royalty in Europe. You can come to the Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark 
And you will see that a great big picture of this king married to here, and this princess from Germany married to a prince here from Switzerland, and all that goes on and on. So that, you know, if you're all married, you'll be one happy family, but they still fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> Isn't that the case? That's European history. They had one great time, they had a hundred year war in Europe. Never has it been united by marriage at all, because that's been tried by many different civilizations. Today, while we're sitting here, there's another attempt going on called the United States of Europe, and there's been some big name people wanting to see this happen. Even George Washington, President of the United States of America, this is what he said. One day, on the model of the United States of America, a United States of Europe will come into being. Interesting. George was not only the president, he was some sort of a prophet, at least he thought he was, but he failed, you can see. In fact, some modern leaders, President Mitterrand of France, he said, listen, a great power is being born a few years ago. Then there was Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of Germany. The course is irreversible. We're going to make this thing happen. And what have we seen just a few weeks ago? Brexit. Come on, we're not united. We're not one superpower. Might be one currency, but that's falling to pieces too now, of course. And I mean, they're not falling to pieces for many of them, but the Brits didn't even want to get into the currency thing. This is what Romano Prodi said. We can and we will succeed in creating a unified, prosperous, democratic Europe where citizens can live in peace and freedom. That's Romano Prodi. He was the president of the European Commission back in those days. Now, interestingly, the same magazine that he said that in on the turn of the millennium, the European Commission said the editor is still far from being the European government that Prodi would like to claim that it is. And you know tonight they're, they're still not there. That's by a long shot. You know, when I see things like that, my friends, it makes me realise this book <laughs> is different. It's historically accurate. It's not a bunch of fairy tales. And its prophecies are dependable. They are reliable every time they come out. And the Bible said they shall not please. So there's Daniel. He's talking to this king and he comes to the last bit. He says, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image in a feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Now what's that stone? Daniel tells the king what that stone represents. As he's told him about everything else, notice what he says. In the days of these kings, that's the divided kings, Europe, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. No one's going to take it over. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. This is God's kingdom, you say. The last empire is about to happen on planet Earth. We've been through everything else. How soon? Notice what it says, in the days of these kings. In other words, down in the toes, there's not much below the toes, is there? That's where this thing ends, he says. And the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. That's our time. We're living in the final time. And this is an incredible prediction from 2,500 years ago. The last empire is about to appear, and that's good news, because... The biblical writer John, who wrote a parallel book in the last one in the Bible called the Book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, I want you to notice what he said about this empire. It's quite thrilling. Right there in the middle of the Book of Revelation, he said, he's, at the end of the book, I should say, he saw, he saw this. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things are passed away. He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. You know, my friends, tonight, we need a world like that. Every nightly news, it sickens people. The TV channels are becoming murder channels. As night after night, we see a litany of death and destruction on our planet. John says, this kingdom will be a kingdom of no more tears. Can you imagine what it's going to be like where you will never see somebody broken hearted because their husband walked out on them with some other woman? Or some woman 
left. Or some kids, because their dad <coughs> beats them, beats them just about to a pulp. There's coming a day when there'll be no more tears. That's the sort of world we desperately need. Not only that, he says, no more pain. I don't know about you, but there are probably some people here tonight that suffer pain. I have a friend <coughs> that was a, a paratrooper with the SAS forces some years ago. He jumped out, <coughs> landed wrongly. Pat has suffered pain for 40 years and had a morphine drip most of that time. You know, what a day when we don't even have to have a hospital anymore. No sickness, the Bible says. That's the sort of thing. No sorrow. I remember watching the, the Italian earthquake that had taken place back up in the late 70s. And here's this, this mother or a wife, I don't know who she was, but she was just throwing herself uncontrollably on that grave. Man, we need a world like that. No sorrow, no death. We've stood over too many open graves and said goodbye to too many good people, haven't we? Too many loved ones. There's coming a day when that's gone. That's what this book says. That's what its prophecy says. And that's what Daniel is saying here. He says, this kingdom will never pass away. And then he signed off. The great God has shown the king what shall come to pass in the future. And he says, the dream is certain. And the interpretation is sure. And he's pretty confident, isn't he, the way he signed off here. Absolutely. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Babylon, the head of gold, has come and it's gone, just like Daniel did. Medo-Persia, the silver chest and arms, it came on the scene of power and it went, just like was predicted. So too the Greeks, the brass, thighs and belly, they had their day and they moved on. The Romans and then a divided kingdom of Rome, which were what we would call Western Europe today, every single thing has happened, my friend. Not one. Now, Daniel could have said, listen, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, there's going to be seven superpowers, and he would have been wrong. But he said four, and then a divided one. Now, that's exactly how it's happened. And we have it one to two hundred years BC. It's reported there in the Dead Sea Scroll. The Dead Sea Scrolls go back to 100 to 200 BC. Now, listen, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not the son of a prophet, but I'm going to make a prediction tonight. Are you listening? <laughs> Here's my prediction. When you go to bed tonight, you're going to take your shoes off your feet before you jump into bed. That's my prediction. <laughs> not too many of us wear our boots. Do it. But no, seriously now, now, when we look at our feet tonight, this is what we should be thinking. We're down in the feet of iron and clay weak and divided and it's soon to pass away there's not much left is there mm -hmm. that's where we are today in the stream of time it's amazing what Daniel predicted and that's why this book is so helpful today it doesn't guess at the future it knows so there's that submarine it's sitting on the bottom of the ocean just off the coast with that haunting question <coughs> is there any hope as the divers were trying to work out a way, they decided to send a message to the submariners and they tapped the message with their hammers. And this was their message. Yes, there is hope. Meaning we're going to get you out. And you think, my friend, tonight, our world has that same haunting question. And this prophecy that we've seen tonight as just a, a, a sample of the fact that this book has prophetic dependability. It's got a proven track record. This prophecy says what? Yes, there is hope. We're not going out and flip the big bang. There is hope. There is a glorious future. Now, I don't know what you notice about these predictions that were made in 2000 and 2012, but generally speaking, what was the theme? Gloom and doom, right? A wave's going to wash over the Himalayas and we're all going to go Peter that way. You saw that film probably. Lots of different scenarios, but generally it was gloom and doom. There was not much hope. Let me tell you, in this book, the prophecies offer hope. They offer hope with peace and meaning and purpose in life. I want to show you this as we close. This is what Jeremiah says, and he has lots of predictions. 
He says, I know the plan. Well, God is speaking through Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you what? A hope and a future. And my friends tonight, that's what we need. And there is a book that has that. So don't miss tomorrow night. We're going to take you to two amazing places together. And by the way, this is something you may not have realised. In this book, there are 800 prophetic verses, roughly. 90% of them have already been fulfilled in ancient civilizations, like you see around here that we're talking about in our first session and this session. 90% of the predictions have already happened. That means only 10%. These predictions, one of them tomorrow night, I'm going to show you. We're going to go to the city, the, the, the Herod's fortress of Masada, the air of the Dead Sea. Anybody been to Masada? Okay, some of you have been an amazing place. We're going to go to Masada in Jerusalem, and I'm going to show you an incredible prediction again from the book of Daniel that actually predicts the coming of the Romans and what would take place. It's unbelievable. Well, that's one of the 90% that have been fulfilled, but you need to see it tomorrow night. And then, in our second session tomorrow afternoon, isn't it? I'm going to be taking you to look at one of the prophecies dealing with the 10% that are yet to be fulfilled or in process of. We're going to go in that program to Pompeii. How near is the end? Don't miss tomorrow. You need to invite a friend tomorrow afternoon. What time is it, by the way? Two o'clock, is it? Two o'clock, okay. So, invite a friend to come. They'll be so glad you invite them because we're going to go to the civilization of Pompeii and we're going to see an incredible high octane prophecy that was made 2,000 years ago that show us exactly where we are today. So I look forward to being with you tomorrow afternoon in that program.